I don't know about you, but the music this morning has been especially good. It has been a privilege to have so many different type or so many different music genres represented in one service. Um, and I do want to say thank you very much, Dana, for joining us today. You know, it's amazing. You see, Dana Howell's here because at the end of the service, I mentioned last week, we're going to do something slightly different. And she's here to provide a little bit of music at the end of the service. Ends up, she's doing everything in the service. You know, that uh, offertory piece that they just played a few moments ago, uh, they just showed up for church and said, okay, let's do it this way. I mean, that's how good they are. So what a privilege it is to have such wonderful talent in the church and for those who come to spend time with us. I do want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 13. We're going to be in verses 11 through 14 this morning. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11 through 14. I believe that most people who are here this morning would agree with me that time is flying by quickly this year. You know what I'm talking about. Just the other day, I believe it was just the other day, I was preaching my first sermon here at First Baptist Church in Florence. Wasn't that just a couple days ago, Al? I think it was. And then all of a sudden, it's about eight months and some odd days later, summer is almost over. School's getting ready to start. Sorry about that reminder, teachers. But nonetheless, things are moving quickly in this year. Uh, if you and I were to recall, say, the last eight months of what is taking place within our church, uh, we would have to say sometimes bad things happen and sometimes good things happen happen. In other words, if we were to remember some of the things that took place, some things would be absurd. Some would probably be achievements taking place. Or perhaps we would have fought a few battles, but then we would also had some new beginnings as well. We would have had some moments of casualness, but then we would have had some wonderful moments of commitment. You're starting to get the picture. Things are changing and there's some good things that take place in our changes. And sometimes there's some bad things that take place. But here's the question I have for all of this morning. Are you ready? Well, ready for what? Well, we're getting ready to get to that here in Romans chapter 13. But the question is, are you ready? Um, most often when we ask, are you ready? We're talking about those temporal things, the things of this earth. Are you ready to go here? Are you ready to do this? But listen, let me ask you the question, are you ready? Are you ready for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Are you ready? In the passage that we're getting ready to read, the Apostle Paul literally thunders that question, are you ready? And he's speaking specifically about the return of Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, reading through verse 14. The Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, wrote... And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. We thank you for the reading of your word. We're thankful, Lord God, for the singing of your word as well. We're thankful, Lord, for this prayer, the ones that were lifted previously and the ones to come. But right now, we pray, Lord God, through the preaching and teaching of your word, that your anointing spirit will be upon us all, not just in the delivering of the word, but, Lord God, in the hearing of the word. Change our lives today. We love you. We praise you. And it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. There are two men who were good friends years ago, and finally they got together after many years of being apart. A lot had changed in their lives. Just like all of us, some things were good, some changes were not so good or bad. And so as they started to talk and reminisce and uh, find out what's been going on in their lives, the conversation went something like this. The one man asked how things are going, and the second man said, well, I got married. Well, that's a good news. 
but she's ugly. Well, that's bad news. But she is very rich. Well, that's good news, but she's a little bit stingy. Well, that's kind of bad news. But she did buy me a house. Well, that's good news, but the house built and burnt down. Well, that's bad news. But she was in it. Well, you know the rest of that story, don't you? I mentioned sometimes things are bad, sometimes things are good. And we see that in the return of Christ, every one of us would probably say, well, that's a good thing. But think about those who are not ready. Think about those who are lost in their sins. Those who have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You might be able to say, I am ready. But what about your one? We've been looking at the campaign, who's your one? Who's that one person God would place upon your heart and in your mind that needs to know Jesus? Who's that one? Are they ready? Paul warns us it is high time. It's a prophetic passage pointing to the return of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, the apostle Paul gives to us five admonitions Five warnings, you might say, what we as Christians must do to be ready. And how does that connect with who's your one? Well, when we're ready, then we're also going to be better prepared to share with others so that they too can be ready. Are you ready? Here's the first admonition given by the Apostle Paul. First, he would tell you, wake up. He says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Literally, he thunders to us, wake up. The assumption given here is that as followers of Christ, we need to know the time. And I'm not talking about you need to have a look at your watch. Don't start looking. I just started preaching. It's not talking about your watch or pulling out your phone and seeing what time it is. We're talking about knowing the times, understanding our culture, understanding what's taking place in the world today. We're to know our time. And if we are to know our times, we know it's getting closer. Jesus is coming. Know your time. Paul says, wake up. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. What an obvious statement. You understand what he means by that. He's not saying that uh, we are not saved uh, uh, the moment we receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior, but that day by day as you and I live this life on this celestial ball called earth, that you and I are getting closer and closer to the day of perfection, closer and closer to the day of completion, to that time when we will not only be sanctified, we'll be glorified. Wake up. Paul says, Jesus is coming. Now with that in mind, this admonition also comes with a couple implications. In other words, Paul is implying two things on this admonition, wake up. First of all, wake up implies that we have fallen asleep. On December 3rd, 2013, an engineer operating a commuter train, New York Hudson Line, fell asleep while he was supposed to be driving the train. He ended up taking a 30 mile an hour curve at 82 miles an hour. And in doing so, he derailed the train, killed four people and injured numerous others. He fell asleep at the the steering wheel, so to speak. He should have been awake. The tragedy, as much as it was, could have been avoided. In fact, the experts say, first of all, if he was, wasn't asleep, obviously the accident wouldn't have happened. But they said that even if he would have woke up just moments prior to the curve, he could have avoided that tragic accident. In other words, he needed to wake up. Paul tells us, wake up. The reason why he tells us to wake up is because we have fallen asleep. Uh, You know, I'm sure we can come up with a long list of culprits that probably lulled us into this slumber. But let me share with you three. Number one, I believe it's because of our confusion. In other words, in this world today, there is every kind of uh, religiosity, as you can imagine, and it's out there for everyone to see. You understand, if you put it on the internet, it's around the world in just a matter of moments. There is confusion in this world, and I believe because of this confusion, many people are believing false beliefs, living false lies, and in that, we have been confused in our faith. But that's not the only thing that has rocked us to sleep, not only confusion, but I'd have to say also complacency. 
Many years ago, as you know, I've served in the military for 21 years. One of my later assignments was to train the Arkansas National Guard as well as the Oklahoma National Guard, specifically for the purpose of them going to Yugoslavia to take over the military mission there. Uh, and so in that, I had to often travel from Arkansas back to Fort Benning, Georgia, where a new unit was getting ready to deploy, and I would train them in something called T-CERT, uh, theater-specific uh, individual readiness training. In other words, I would train them on what to expect when they got into Yugoslavia. With that in mind, the specialty that I was given was countermine mine operations. In other words, land mines. And the very first rule I had to have to teach all the students is simply this, complacency kills. And here's what the, the example would be. You'd go into a minefield and you'd say, okay, that's not really a mine. All right, toss it aside. You'd go into another area and it looks like there's a, an IED and you'd go and you'd start inspecting it. Next thing you know, you'd find out, well, it's not really a landmine. And you go to another one, the same thing happens and then you get complacent and next thing you know, you don't follow the proper procedures and you go up to the landmine and you do something you're not supposed to do and complacency kills. And the same is true with our Christian faith. We are lulled to sleep because we have become complacent to the world. We are tired of waiting for Jesus. Uh, Sister Jane and I were talking this morning about, oh, if the Lord would come today, I'd be blessed. And I would be. But we've become complacent, waiting for Jesus, expecting him back, but not really. And so when we become complacent in that area, we, com com we become complacent in the reading of God's Word. We become complacent in our prayers to the Lord. We com uh, become complacent to our attendance of, of corporate worship. We become complacent, and complacency kills, and I believe it helps to put us in this slumber that we're often in. Confusion, complacency, and here's a third one. How about, uh, simply put, compromise? We have compromised our faith when we take man's word over God's word. That's a compromise. We compromise our faith when we say things like, well, it probably really doesn't matter at all. And that compromise has put us to sleep. In fact, I believe we're stuck in the Garden of Eden and, and the question that Satan has taught us is upon our lips. Did God really say I mean, think about all the things that takes place that we are, we are supposed to be firm in our belief and, and ask that question. Did you say that question? Did God really say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Well, did God really say that? I mean, after all, there's so much scientific evidence for evolution. Did God really say? Uh, what about the sanctity of human life? as we fight against such atrocities as abortion and euthanasia. Did God really say we're created in his image? Did he really say that? We're compromising in our beliefs. What about uh, as God in the very beginning meant them to be male and female and that for the, the man was to leave his mother and his father and cling unto his wife. In other words, when we think about the... the um, atrocity and the, the horridness of what we call homosexual marriages, did God really say we are compromising in our beliefs? And I believe it's lulled us into sleep. We have fallen asleep. Paul says, wake up. Uh, not only does it uh, imply that we have fallen asleep, it implies that we have need of assistance. Uh, in my household, I am considered the Crawford alarm clock. In other words, if you want to get up early in the morning, just wait, I'll get you up. Because I'm always up early in the morning. I'm the alarm clock for the Crawford household. Paul, writing to the Roman church and even to us today, he is the alarm clock because evidently we cannot wake up on ourselves. And the alarm clock that Paul is using is the precious word of God. You see, this is what needs to be preached from the pulpit. I, I cannot give you anything else. I cannot give you something that is not nutritious. I cannot give you a five-hour uh, pick-me-up drink 
drink or whatever those are called. I can't give you an energy drink. All I got is the banquet of God's bountiful uh, word to, that you and I can feast upon. In other words, we need assistance. That assistance comes from the word of God. And when the pulpits of America stop preaching the word of God, we will fall into slumber. We will sleep and will not awake. Are you ready? Paul tells us to wake up, but he doesn't stop there. Not only are we to wake up, he tells us we're to clean up as well. I don't know about you, but I do hope this occurred on some sense or some level. When I woke up this morning, I brushed my teeth. How about you? I got cleaned up. In other words, there's a number of other things that I did, uh, rituals, you might say, each morning to ensure that I am cleaned up. Paul writes it this way, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. And literally he says, wake up, then clean up. Again, I believe there are two implications here. First of all, when he tells us to clean up, it implies the condition of sin. What put us into this lull is sin in our hearts. What caused us to go to sleep is sin. Sin is in us. Uh, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, the word of God teaches us. In other words, sin is in us, and that is our condition. We need to clean up because of the condition of sin in our hearts and in our lives. But listen, when there's the condition of sin, there must be something else. And this is, uh, I guess you can say this is an implication on the implication. This is implied or an imperative on what it was implied. It is implied the condition of sin, but to clean up, we must have the confession of sin. We must confess that which is wrong. We must confess that it's in our hearts and in our minds. There must be a confession of sin. John reminds us of that on 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and verse 9. Verse 7, it says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in uh, the light, we have fellowship with one and another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9 of, of 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we're to wake up from our slumber. And once we are awake, we're told we're to clean up, get rid of the sin that's in our hearts and in our lives. And I don't know but one uh, proper detergent that can, can cleanse sin. You know exactly who it is. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, what what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Wake up and clean up. Here's a third admonition found in this passage. Paul would also tell us to dress up. Most people, when they get up in the morning, have that ritual I was talking about earlier. We wake up, we get cleaned up, and, and most people like to go ahead and get dressed before they leave the door. Now, I understand in today's day and age, it's appropriate for some to wear PJs to work, to Walmart and everywhere else. But I believe in actually getting dressed before I leave the house. And Paul tells us not only do we need to wake up, we need to clean up, but we also need to dress up. He says specifically, and let us put on the armor of light. Now with that in mind, two more things are implied. First of all, what is implied here is an imminent attack. Uh, why else would you put on armor other than the fact that we are in the midst of attack? If they are not in the midst, it is coming. It is right behind. It's been said of uh, most people, if not all people, that you're either heading into the storm, you're in the middle of the storm, or you're just coming out of a storm. The one thing that is certain of every single person in this room is there are storms ahead. So get ready for them. There is an imminent attack. He tells us to put on the armor of light. Uh, I believe it's synonymous as well with the armor of Jesus Christ, which we'll read about in a few moments. But it's also synonymous with the armor of God that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. In fact, let me uh, turn there, if you will. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. You remember these words of what we're to put on each and every day by the power of the Spirit and by prayer. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done to all, or done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith which is with you and able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints we're to put on the whole armor of God it is an imminent attack in, in fact, I would venture to say the attack is on, and it is ongoing. So dress up. Here is a second thing that is implied. Because of an imminent attack, Paul tells us to put on an illuminating armor. Let us put on the armor of light. I mentioned a moment ago, this is synonymous with the armor of God, the armor of light. In verse 14 of our text, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus is the light of the world. John chapter eight and verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And in verse John, verse, uh, chapter one, verse five, we are reminded that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We're to put on Jesus. And when we put on Jesus, we put on the light. We put on the light of our Lord and Savior. It is an illuminating armor. After all, Jesus is the one who guides our every step. Jesus is the one who is the bright and morning star. Put on the armor of light. So we're to wake up. We're to clean up. We're to dress up by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a fourth admonition that's given to us in this passage. He also calls upon us to live up. In other words, verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife, and envy. To wake up points towards the need for our awareness. To clean up points towards the need for our admission to sin. To dress up points towards the need for appropriate attire. But to live up points towards the need to possess the right attitude, which will always lead to the right actions. We are to live up. And again, a couple implications, a couple things that this implies. Number one, uh, the admonition to live up means that we're gonna live, uh, live up through our proper walk with the Lord, our proper walk with the Lord. Let us walk properly in the day. You know, it means just that. To, if you profess Jesus, live in Jesus. If you say you believe in the word of God, live by the word of God. We're to walk properly with our Lord. And then Paul gives us a list of don'ts it's not a, a comprehensive list, but a list nonetheless. He tells us that we're not to have revelry, also interpreted rioting. That goes quite well with drunkenness. It also implies that which is sexually immoral when he says to avoid lewdness and lust. We're to avoid walking in strife and in envy. We're not to have quarrels about us, jealousies. Rather, we're to possess the right attitude, which will lead to the right action. There's another hymn that, hymn that all of us know and love quite well that probably addresses this topic quite easily. It, it's the hymn, Living for Jesus. You see, if we live for Jesus, all else will be put aside. Living for Jesus, the life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that we do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior. I give myself to thee. Have you given yourself to Jesus? Are you ready? We are called to live up through our proper walk with the Lord. Now this will lead to something else. When you and I live up through our proper walk with the Lord, then it'll also help us to have our proper witness of the Lord. In other words, when we walk in the light of Jesus Christ, we will witness to others who are walking us walk in the light of Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter two, verses 11 through 12. 
Uh, the, the apostle Peter writes, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, remember this is not our home. We are just a uh, passing through. Uh, abstain from lo uh, fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evil de doers, that they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. We're to have our proper witness of the Lord and that will be indicated by the way we walk in the the Lord. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 we're reminded of this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me, Jesus says, in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The admonition here is to live up to the name that has been given to you. Are you a Christian? Then the name given is Christ. Live up to the name of Christ. Paul admonishes us. He warns us. Wake up clean up, dress up, and oh, by the way, live up. This leads to the fifth and final admonition in this passage. The apostle Paul would also say, well, how are you going to accomplish this task? Well, let me just tell you in and of yourself, you're not. You can't do it. I can't do it. But when you and I look up to the one who can do it, all things are possible. Paul put it this way. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We're to look up. Again, it implies two things. Number one, it points really towards our faith. The phrase put on the Lord Jesus Christ summarizes a, the spiritual process called sanctification. In other words, God is working a, a mighty miracle wonder in me. And that is, he is turning me into the likeness of his son. But it's just not me. It's all who call upon the name of Jesus. That's the process of sanctification. God is turning us into the likeness of his son. And it points towards our faith. We're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that term provision, uh, as in make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust, implies forethought. In other words, make no provision means you're planning not to do that. Paul is warning us, plan on not doing bad behavior. He's calling upon us to do that. Our faith, our witness in the Lord Jesus Christ is, is dependent often by the way we act in life. Don't have a poor witness in Jesus. Look up our faith. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a matter of spiritual maturation. Our faith. Look up. As we think about our faith, it brings into another point. And when we think about our spiritual maturation, it's not only a reference that the admonition to look up is a reference to our faith. It is also a reference to our focus. In fact, Paul says, put on whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be our focus in all things. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 reminds us, looking unto uh, Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith. In John chapter 12, verse 32, this is why Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw on all people unto myself. That's where our focus is to be. Uh, I have, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but I have some talents and I have some skills. Uh, they're not very good ones. In fact, they're not, uh, not only they're not very good, but I haven't really progressed in them. As you know, I play the bass. I don't play it great or anything. I just, don't, but I love to do it. I believe it's a, a talent or a skill that I have. Uh, but I have a, another talent or skill, you might call it. I know how to juggle. In my office, I have juggling balls. And sometimes when uh, uh, I'm frustrated, usually after I get out, uh, off the phone with somebody, not one of you, of course. Uh, but, you know, I, if I'm frustrated, if I'm in between passages, if I just want to take a break, I want my mind be, to be at ease, I will just sit back, grab my juggling balls, and start juggling. I just enjoy juggling. Now, with that in mind, juggling has taught me a few things. One of the things it's taught me is focus. In other words, you have to figure out what you want to focus on. I've got two eyeballs. I, most of you probably have two eyeballs as well. And if you're juggling three balls with two eyeballs, something's wrong there, isn't it? 
In other words, you've got two eyeballs and three balls in the air, and eventually, if you're focusing with your two eyeballs and, and that's what your focus is, guess what? You're going to drop the ball. But the same can be said about our hands. I've got three balls and only two hands. If my focus while juggling is upon my hands, then eventually I'm going to drop one of those balls that are up in the air. I will not be prepared. So what do you focus on when juggling? Well, the easy answer is simply this. You focus on the highest object. That's how you, you part of the juggling thing. You focus on the higher object, everything else falls into your peripheral vision. And so as the balls go up in the air, my, my eyes will stay with the highest point. Now here is my point. If you focus on your power, your hands in this life that we live, you're going to drop the ball. If you use your eyes only and all you're focusing on is your circumstances around you, guess what? You're going to drop the ball. But if you focus on the highest point, if you focus on our Lord Jesus Christ, if you keep him in your focus, everything else comes into the peripheral vision and everything is much better because your focus is on Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus is to be on Christ and Christ alone. The centricity of Christ is the focus of the church. The centricity of Christ is the focus of every Bible study we must do. The centricity of Christ is the focus of our marriages. The centri uh, centricity of Christ must be the focus of everything in our Christian walk. So the final admit, uh, admonition given by Paul is to look up. It points to our faith. Our faith is meaningless if our focus is incorrect. So focus on Christ and our faith will then be in Christ. I want to conclude the message this morning by returning back to the beginning. And that is by asking the simple question. Are you ready? But let me add to that, the one who's on your, lot, uh, on your heart, the one that God has planted that seed in your mind, in your heart, are they ready? But they're not my responsibility. I didn't ask if they're your responsibility. Are they ready? Then don't you want to do everything you can to help them to get ready for the return of the Lord? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. We're thankful, Lord God, for the clearness of the call that you've given to the Apostle Paul and then given to us. Lord God, we do need to wake up. We need to witness what's taking place around you, us. We need to be uh, men and women on the watchtower looking out. And Lord, there is a dire need, not just in the world, but in this church in our churches, and in our lives to be cleaned up as well. Lord, may we see sin for what it is and confess it and be cleansed by you. Lord, I, I pray that we will each be putting on the armor of light, the armor of God, that will dress, be dressed properly each day as we go into this world in this spiritual battle. I pray, Lord God, that we'll live a life that is honoring to you in that name that you've given to us, the name of Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that in all matters we'll look to you in our faith and in our focus. We love you, we praise you. And it is in the precious and in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.